So that's it. That's it, Rob. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that is it, huh? Yep, I'm done. Done with this whole thing. Uh, tell me, tell me, what, Rob Stenzinger of uh, interactive-storyteller.com. Uh, tell me what you mean by the words after dark. After dark, um, <clears throat> I think of it both, I suppose, in a uh, a childhood hope of trying to get the um, over the air, you know, like so back when televisions could, uh, you know, when you tuned the tuner, it wasn't like a button you pushed or a digital thing. It was a um, <clears throat> it was a it was a mechanical analog device that you could put you could you could gently nudge it so it could sit in between so it wasn't just you know one channel next channel next channel and there was these in-betweens and uh, there was like a I think it was called SpectraVision that had material that I was curious about at a at an age where it made sense for me to be curious about that material that's what I, that's one of the reasons, kinds of after dark I think of I also think of um, some entertaining additional sort of off-topic talk from podcasts when I hear that phrase. Yeah, some other people do that. Um, I've, heard, I've heard this term. They, they, back when I did the Art and Story show, uh, there was talk of doing an Art and Story After Dark, which was uh, going to be um, a sort of like a blue show, uh, a, a, an adults-only show, and to which, at which point anybody who's listened to anything I've done for any considerable amount of time would know that, geez, that doesn't sound like something Jersey would do, and yes, you are right. Uh, that was where I said, like, well, you guys can do it. I, I wouldn't. I probably wouldn't be very comfortable in that kind of environment. <laughs> if Don Rickles suddenly started attacking me, I'd probably just go, oh, why are you saying those things? But, um, but anyway, uh, so you, we were talking, usually before we do the Lean Into Art shows, we talk a little bit for a half hour or more about as we're getting ready for the thing, talking about prepping for it. But then we'll also get on these, these weird tangential things, and you brought up the notion of possibly doing an after dark. And so I want yeah. to get your definition and then see if anybody would like that. Yeah, so the idea for us in After Dark would be um, probably neither after or nor dark. <laughs> uh, I so, you. <laughs> feel free to join me on the whiteboard there. Um, so After Dark would be uh, additional content as we're preparing. It'd be behind the scenes kinds of things, right? So when we produce a podcast, um, we try not to have a lot of editing work to do, but there's often a little bit as far as <laughs> uh, is that uh, Mac at night? Mac tonight. <laughs> or Mac tonight, there he is. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> All my memories are of the 80s. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's cool. Um, I remember they had a life-size Mac Mac tonight at uh, a, a local McDonald's that was near. Terrifying. And yeah, had a little auto-playing piano and stuff. It's quite, quite uh, awesome. Sometimes creepy, depending on how you looked at it. Um, anyway, it. Uh, which I guess, if you're curious, what that what the heck that character is, you're watching the video. He was a piano-playing moon. <laughs> so that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, I, I didn't mean to sidetrack us with that. I was just drawing no, while you were no, talking. No, no, uh, but it's exactly this kind of thing. Like, we may talk about other things that come to mind. It's very extemporaneous. It's also sometimes, like, intense preparation for what we're about to talk about. Um, and, yeah, today we end up, we, we tackled a few different topics that afterward I thought, well, there was a good podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that we didn't record. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so anyway anybody wants to um let us know if such a thing would be interesting hearing us kind of jag on different philosophical to topics um you can email us at lean into art at gmail cool dot com um, and of course, we love hearing from you on Twitter and on Google Plus. Anywhere you can get a hold of us on the social nets. It is great. Oh, and of course, the other option is uh, uh, we have a contact form, mm -hmm. which actually was recently upgraded because uh, we want to make sure that uh, when you do send us a message, um, hey, is it cool if we read this on the air? 
or oh, maybe, right. maybe we'll copy it into a post or some show notes or something. Um, so we updated that form a little bit. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just at um, leanintoart.com slash contact. And there's a link at the bottom of every page as well. So, Okay, so that was my curveball. Not mm-hmm. much of one, but it was something. Uh, so uh, Lean Into Art, episode 22, mm-hmm. we're going to talk about design this week. Mm-hmm. We're going to talk about design. We're, we, uh, we did an episode about design a couple episodes ago, and we, we kind of went here and there and all over the place about it. Um, but the, the gist of what we talked about was, this is something that you think is really important, Rob. Uh, yeah, so just design as an overall concept. Um, I, I realized, it, let's see, being a, a fan of, of intentional and creative communication and, um, you know, often uh, I'll, I'll think about, well, how could I um, accomplish a given design more effectively? How could I um, communicate this idea more concisely or what have you? I, I mean, I really um, engage with and uh, chew on this idea of design quite a bit. But sometimes I think I'm not as strong of an advocate of it as I could be. And so when we were, when we really, let's see, we, in the, during our Lean Into Art episode, Mad About Design, um, <clears throat> we got into some, some interesting territory about how, uh, let's, d- different roles on projects and uh, some of the value of design. But I think what we want to do is go deeper and uh, actually probably a little bit broader as well. So we'll cover yes. our idea at this time when we record these podcasts about exploring what is design, how can we, how can we spread it, how do we uh, gain a greater uh, appreciation and uh, become stronger designers, and, and how do we relate to people in different design pursuits and those that aren't. Because, of course, part of this is definitely design advocacy. And as people are going to see as we start to talk about this, this does relate very deeply to visual storytelling. You use design a lot in visual storytelling. Um, we're we're going to start with a very broad definition at this point in time as to what design is. Um, and I think one of the things that I threw at you last night as we were doing the prep for this thing um, was, do you d- define design as the intentional arrangement of objects or images or words to evoke a certain message or meaning or emotional response in the user? Is, is that what you would... Does that summarize it okay? I think it does. I think that is an excellent working definition of design. I think any working definition of design, we need to capture the idea that we are purposefully structuring ideas to accomplish something and I would then you could add other decorations to the definition to make it feel better in different situations like you could say in response to uh, constraints Mm -hmm. or in response to constraints to accomplish a a given uh, a given goal but it's that intentionality uh, with communication that I think is at its heart right we're trying to sculpt ideas Oh, there you go. Sculpting ideas. This is some, yeah, this is in uh, some of the notes that you were taking uh, on this is like sculpting and being sculpted. I don't want to go there just yet. I want to hand this off to you because this you've done the lion's share of organizing thoughts on this one. And all I can do is uh, respond to and uh, build upon the scaffolding that you sort of constructed around this, the, the, the information you designed for this talk about thinking about design. Where do you want to go? Where do I want to go? Um, let's see. I, I think I, I, I have the urge to go to a brief disclaimer. Um, okay. We're going to get obtuse. We're going to get um, we're going we're going to go off in the weeds here and there, and uh, that's part of the joy of wrapping your head around something that helps you d- identify and see things around you. Is you bust out of your matrix and you enjoy the pain and love of recursion and trying to figure out how you're figuring something out. As you figure out the tools you're using to figure it out, etc. So whatever, just show me how to do the thing, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, if if that is your concern, uh, it sounds like um, I do hope you 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 are curious about design 
and uh, uh, and whatnot because the uh, the result matters a lot. I don't want to dodge the idea that well, of course, we're doing this to produce things, but we're doing this to produce produce things both um, you know creatively, pragmatically to um, and then to again convey the value of doing that. Like, what is that process, and why should you engage in it? So it's going to get a, a abstract sometimes. As as anything that's worth digging into and doing well is, you know, it's like anybody. We all accept the fact that when it comes to illustration, a deep knowledge of the fundamentals of how to illustrate, like how the human figure looks and how it works. Uh, everybody tells you, uh, anybody who's ever taken a figure drawing class says, oh my gosh, even though I work in a cartoony style, my work has improved as a result of understanding some key fundamentals of how the human figure works, right? Uh, which may seem like, oh boy, this is a little bit like work, having to study all these naked people, so in order I can learn all my muscle groups and everything, but uh, or, or drapery or anything. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to spend too much time apologizing for it, though, because uh, anybody who's been listening to us for any kind of uh, long period of time knows that we don't talk about anything that's intended to, to uh, make matters worse for anybody, right? Uh, yeah, very true. We're not trying to make this worse for you. We're not trying to be dodgy and fortune cookie about it. It's um, <laughs> Part of this is it, it is an effort. That is a, a, a that I feel is a worthwhile one to go about describing it. Part of it is um, allow me to be your guinea pig in going off on this journey to describe it better, and feel free to share your ideas where we're uh, where we're on the mark and and where we're wandering a field here, uh, because it's part of the idea is that we're you know capturing essence and ideas surrounding design, celebrating it, describing it a bit more, to get better at communicating it, to make it easier to spread, because it's really worthwhile. And we, we believe in that kind of intentional, uh, caring, purposeful communication and mm. creativity. It's not just, well, communication as, uh, um, as in building systems, as in building comics and stories and uh, logos. Uh, they are all potentially very f intentional forms of communication that can benefit from uh, design. So just as uh, if you're designing something in a um, so it, in an industrial sense where it's 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 a chair or it's a um, it's a it's a physical object or what have you, understanding the mechanics of a human being is incredibly important. Um, you know where where do we bend where do we bend and where don't we bend? <laughs> yeah. Useful questions and observations that, uh, as you get into design, you'll um, likely be embracing questions and observations quite a bit to help you uh, express. Well, one way where I look at design is that it's a theory. So. As you're Which going it's, through, the, it's not useful then. <laughs> it's not useful. <laughs> uh, no, it's it is uh, it is. It grows in its use based on how much it is tested. So yeah, if you are sitting there having a a, um, a beer with your friends and or a soda at the soda fountain, um, because you time travel and you live in the fifties and stuff. <laughs> Um, <laughs> that's cool. You're welcome here if you time travel. Um, but uh, yeah, try not to cause any you know weird events there, because I liked being born and stuff. But um, <laughs> <laughs> let's say you're you just something hits you. It, it's inspiration based. It, you have an idea for um, like a, a better design for a can because you realize that well the cans are kind of slippery and they do this weird thing. You have this response to a problem. All of a sudden, that problem is becomes a set of questions, and now you have some designs that are, you're coming up with as a set of answers. But you might do that it, very instinctually, and I think you know a lot of times we do initially. But even though that that is a valid stage of design, I don't think it has become its sort of uh, result, functional, useful, action, actionable design yet. Um, even though 
um, that's an important start starting point. So, yeah, I mean, you may have a stage of design that really isn't technically useful in and of itself, but it can become so. And here's a good example of where we're going to get abstract. So, yeah, um, we're chewing on it, and I hope you in, uh, engage along with us as we go through this series. Um, currently planned to be a few different podcasts. We will intersperse as far as in our feed and flow. Um, there will be other topics as we go along, as we take a break from this and prepare for it and come back, but this will be a series. Um, and I am now taking a look at <laughs> Jersey's... Uh, huh? Oh, yeah, I was just drawing a robot. There's uh, yep, square, yep, feels one way, circle feels one way, yep. And, yeah, uh, yeah gosh, there's so many things, because in the end, so I mentioned the industrial design. We're designing for people. We're designing for human beings. It doesn't matter if they're ideas, uh, motion picture, comics, audio, a new back scratcher. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. Actually, audio is a good one to bring up too. That's something that people don't uh, think about too much. Is that uh, why? Why does this guy's speech feel different than that guy's speech? Uh, why? Why did I not buy into what this guy was talking about, but I bought into what that guy was talking about? And I mean, this comes into like doing podcasts and also in teaching work. Is that there's different things you can do with your voice. You can design the way you use your voice in the classroom to affect people different ways. So <laughs> when I see kids especially when I teach like college age classes uh, and you see a kid nodding off in the back of the room, I could say, hey, 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 let's pay attention here. Well, that's one way to do it. Or I can not acknowledge that that kid's falling asleep, but go, and if we look over here, boom, that kid's like, what? Something happened. The voice changed, right? He used inflection and that got him uh, back eyes on me without me having to say eyes on me, you know? Ah, yeah. So that that's a design choice too, in the way I monitor my the way my voice is being used in the classroom, the way my body's being used. I'll if I notice that people are starting to get a little less interested, I'll start to animate myself more, move around the room more. Uh, I will when I'm asking the the class a diff difficult question, a really tricky question where there's no real solid answer to, but I want them to cr crunch on it really hard. I'll walk behind the students and I'll ask the question so they're not looking at me, the the, the pedagogue up there saying, "Where's the answer? Give me the answer now, now, now." I'm I'm a, a hovering voice behind them saying, "Dwell on this. Think about it. I'm not pressuring you. Just think about it for a little bit. And when you've got when you got something that's worth sharing, raise your hand." And that is a a really let's see. The, the, the aboutness of what you said is a, is a really key essence to what I think of as good design. You're sharing right. things with consideration to people yep. to have a desired effect. Yep. And you have affordances for people. You have uh, an understanding of people and how you're trying to serve them you know, with, with, that, with that idea. Um, it's, it's not that... Well, you could you could check if what you desire to accomplish was to just dump information or to have something to sit on so you're not on the floor or what have you. You just look at the really bare bones essence of this is a task. I want to check this off my list. I don't care about the how. You can easily do that in a variety of ways. Right. But I think once you start caring about the how and that caring about the how can have another can have secondary effects. As far as people, um, maybe people spread the word they where they like coming to your class because of your style of how you teach. Mm -hmm. Or not, right? They could not okay. like my style, right? Some people, uh, I've had experiences where people feel actually um, threatened by the difficult questions I ask and by my insistence that they think about it, right? Uh, they just want, they're just there for a lecture. Uh, so in, in that case, then, if I'm thinking about my users, perhaps I should switch gears and kick into a lecture to accommodate what the users actually want in that situation. Or not. I mean, this is something where we got to be just intentional about what audience we're trying to serve. Uh, and But then some, you've got some points lined up for uh, discussion about whether or not we're doing it for our own sake or whether we're doing it to serve somebody that changes the nature of how you approach the design. But we don't have to go there just yet. Yeah, and I do think we'll, like, some of these will be themes that will that will come up. Um, and, and, and recur during our conversations, which we anticipate this being a three-part series, this being mm -hmm. the first part um, of our design series, thinking about design. 
And so if this were well, if and and if you know, if we had the our our uh, I don't know full lean into art staff, this is when the the lower third and the credits would 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 be occurring as we're talking, as I because I just said the title. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is where we. I sh I should kick over to yeah, like an animation, like exactly. thinking about design. It, oh yeah, wow, that would be fun, and we could have that logo be, be like ten different interpretations, right? Yeah, thinking about design, and it's just it doesn't even say anything. It just kind of looks like the shapes of and forms of letters. And it just goes, or it could have the masterpiece theater theme playing with a serif font slowly fading in with water underneath it, or it could be stone words that fall down from the ceiling and hit the ground and everything shakes a little bit, or it could be chrome embossed letters popping out with a fist underneath it. You know, it's like sure. WWE this Saturday. Could uh, be a forlorn uh, schoolhouse rock like character looking down as. <laughs> Big old thinking boat design pops in the background, and you know, then he looks up. Is like, do I have to? You know, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. All those things feel very, very different. The seventies rock kicks in. All right, I'll stop my yeah. example. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's there's a uh, um, there's a lot of different. Uh, facets and uh, one one way I've been thinking about it lately is that there are sort of design forces maybe that exist between the designer and your intended audience mm -hmm. sort of um, and as a high level these forces could be personal opinion design principles heuristics and fashion mm, yeah and like any one of these forces could really affect uh, design choices because okay. uh, yeah let's it's... define let's define each of these real quick so how does personal opinion affect design uh, are you talking about the personal opinion of the designer or of the client or of the both. public what are you talking about both okay. um, I think if we yeah I could do a better diagram of this where like there's um, let's see can I doodle on this I suppose I can yeah, you should be able um, to. where the 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 designer probably would have more of this force affecting them than the client or the intended audience, but I do think some the the intended audience could easily have a stake in caring a lot about fashion or caring a lot about personal opinion or even design principles. Mm, pot, that they may categorize it as that. Where I think some we can easily confuse these things with. Um, okay, so we have personal opinion. Yeah, let's define them so we don't confuse them. It's a gut. It's your it it's. Um, and, and taste, and it could be well informed and based on questioning a given area. I'm not saying that anyone, oh, you you don't deserve your opinion. You deserve your opinion no matter what. If it's informed by a bubblegum wrapper or by uh, um, a doctorate thesis, you know, that's cool. It's your opinion. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's, it's informed by your taste and your gut reaction to things, right? Mm -hmm. so so let's take for instance the sugary cereals project that i work on where the branding has traditionally been very busy i intentionally make it very busy why uh that was partially gut reaction but also informed by i'm trying to make this thing feel like uh an anthology cartoon series from like 1987 and branding for kids' products at that time. Well, to this day, kids' products tend to be very busy in its packaging and branding, and I wanted it to feel like that. Now, some people uh, have said, well, gee, you know, sugar cereals would be a lot better of a product if you scaled back and had a more sparse kind of branding on it. Uh, well, that's their opinion. Uh, but th my opinion, since it's my project, rules the day, right? And so I try to apply, as we'll get into design principles, heuristics, and fashion, but uh, what, what initially got me going on that was my personal aesthetic. Mm -hmm. I like yeah, it. Personal aesthetic. Yeah. Like, um, I got a friend who has every website he's ever had has been purple and black because he just loves those two colors together. You know, never tried anything else. Mm, sounds magical. <laughs> <laughs> I know I sounded like a sarcastic jerk there, but really, those are yeah, that that's those are some fantasy colors. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, 
Which I guess, yeah. I mean, so what informed my opinion of that? It's that's uh, that's the, you know, oh gosh, there's a good diagram we should add in the show notes. Uh, the culture, cultural interpretations of color. So I, I think that's that's a, gosh, that's a bit of a combination of 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 all these four, where you you know some things could be an intersection, of um, of of uh, many forces, many influences. That's why I thought of these as like I was trying to think of like what's a primary you know, element that is affecting us. And then and it's a dynamic element, each of these things. So like personal opinion, right? It's uh it's it's less informed, it's it's very it's it's emotional based for the most part. But then you could have like well tested rules based on your emotional based you know opinions and whatnot. You could see how they affect others as you communicate. And I think now you're developing heuristics. Um, and I also think heuristics are like when you would want to apply certain design principles or stretch, stretch them or fashion and whatnot. So you have your own. Um, so personal opinion could be your, your, your default taste. And heuristics is like that refined. You've, you, you're, you're working out with design and you've come up with observations that are tested. Okay. I got another, I got another personal example for that. Yeah. Hmm. Of how heuristics work. So. The color scheme on the Comics Are Great site were based entirely on this guy here. Yeah. Uh, I'm a Supreme. big, yeah, I'm a big fan. He's one of my favorite, like top five favorite Transformers of all time, and I just love his color scheme. And I said, you know what? I'm just gonna grab uh, the eyedropper tool and sample his colors. Those will be the colors that I use for my website. Okay, that's one step. That's that's personal opinion. That's taste. I like those colors. But then mm -hmm. it came to. Is the background of this panel going to be gray or is it going to be orange, right? Mm -hmm. So is the is the website background going to be this color or this color? Or is it going to be this color, right? Uh, what's the link color is going to be? Is it going to be the orange of his little rocket hand or is it going to be the yellow on his boots, right? So there was a lot of playing back and forth to see what really communicated the best, which stood out just the right way, wasn't too loud, wasn't too quiet, right? Trial and error. Yep. Yep. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, trial and error. Rules of thumb. Um, a lot of times, I find rules of thumb being a helpful way to uh, transmit design choices and to try to get them to be uh, collaborative in, in a collaborative environment to have them be uh, um, arrive at similar results more consistently. Because you know, if you're working with people that don't have that same interest in um, you know repeatable design, well, one way to to help make it repeatable is just well, take your heuristics and trial and error and bake it into a rule of thumb that someone else can act on. And a rule of thumb can be something as simple as bigger means more important, smaller means less important, right? Exactly. Exactly. So. Um, or if you're laying out a form on a web page saying um, it's good to have some columns that you have consistent alignment, mm -hmm. so you have more, uh, it's more har more visual harmony. It's more scannable for people to read, right? And uh, discern among the different elements. Uh, design principles. So this would be, let's see, the things that more stand the test of time. That as you approach the mountain of design knowledge out there that uh, it seems to me like folks that I, I have not done a doctoral thesis on this or whatnot but uh, for instance looking at uh, some similarities between like Jonathan Ive, Charles and Ray Eames and uh, uh, you know companies like uh, uh, What's funny is I, uh, I'm just going to admit I thought Herman Herman Miller was like one designer, <laughs> oh, but yeah. it's it's a company and they hire different designers and all that kind of stuff and and uh, but uh, but clearly I mean there's there's names that are very associated with with design and um, you you can tell that they they've separated these different concerns as far as you know fashion and opinion and heuristics and what are they you know they're different mediums that they're choosing to work in and they come up with you know, like helpful observations like um, uh, well we're building things for people usability matters um, the uh, 
there are visual principles we should care about. Hey, let's look at uh, nature and let's look at mathematics, right? And find some interesting connections there that help us reinforce our choices systemically. Mm -hmm. And they come up with, uh, with 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 really cool approaches to that. And they they can structure information. And uh, did you watch that Powers of Ten video that the Eames did, Charles Ray Eames? Um, Have you seen that? that let's I've see that one. It. I did not. I did because that was on the on the on the second uh, disc thing, and I didn't get through that one. But the the video is the film is oh, wait, essentially. No, Powers of Ten. That's the, the this chessboard one, right? Or no, that's the that Powers of that's two to the nth. Yeah, um, Powers of Ten is they start. Uh, they start with a bird's eye view of a couple having a picnic and then they back yeah. out. They start to zoom out and they zoom out every, I think it's like every second they zoom out to 10 times that, that distance until they get all the way out of the entire galaxy. And then they zoom back in and then go 10 times in the other direction down to like the quantum level or whatever. And it's mm. this really great short film that demonstrates scale and uh, uh what's the mathematical term for when you build um exponential growth uh, exponential growth thank you gosh okay. i was on the tip of my tongue but uh yes and so it was a short film that just demonstrated that idea very clearly so information architecture learning how to express a very weird idea in a very clear way in a visual way yeah, yeah, and you say it on paper. Yeah, go ahead. It's interesting, exactly. So, so vi the ability to visualize things across, uh, um, you know, different disciplines, right? So, like you, like they they were able to uh, to show how um, to make it more tangible the effects of the powers of ten, and then uh, the one that I did catch was the. Um, <clears throat> the story as far with the I'm not sure what what kind of royal court it was, but it, but it was a, um, a a king playing chess with one of the members of his court, and uh, it, essentially the um, the prize for winning the game that uh, um, the king said, "Well, you can have any prize you want." And 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 oh, and, the rice exactly. And the the, um, the 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 court member said, "Well, you know, all I want." Is just please fill this chessboard with first one grain of rice, then two grains of rice, and then keep uh, doubling on each that. square. On each square, square, the rice doubles, and then through the powers of yeah uh, exponential growth, exactly. Yeah, by the, by the sixty fourth square, he has a mountain of rice. Yeah, exactly. Well, it would yeah, it would fill all of India to the to a depth of fifty feet. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, well, but clearly, you know, as they were telling the story, the um, the king started to see a pattern here. Once his, you know, castle room, my castle was getting pretty full. So anyway, fun story, fun visualization, a lot of connection between these the different disciplines, and so design principles help solidify some of these ideas. Mm -hmm. um, but then I think very influential as well is that someone can come up with uh, incredible works based on their principles, heuristics, personal opinion, and whatever their taste that are part of fashion. And I, that, um, like, if if we look at, um, well, in, in the world of computing and industrial design, both software and hardware, we've got the uh, the John Ives, Jonathan Ives uh, Apple aesthetic, mm -hmm. and that's a you have you have different uh, in different eras. Different ideas are are, are dominant, right? And and uh, obviously, you know, post two thousand, um, we're we're in a time of of uh, really you know appreciating beauty and simplicity, or trying to, right? So right. seeing really awesome examples of it and saying, well, that is amazing. Um, I I totally want to achieve these same effects. And so looking at the design of, of cars is a good way to tell because you could tell uh, a 1999 Taurus Ford Taurus versus a 2012 Ford Taurus, right? Right. Where I remember in like the late 1990s, late 1990s, early 2000s, that kind of smooth, Ooh. rounded, organic look was really popular in American cars, and all of a sudden the Volkswagen Jetta came out in like 2000, 2001, and it had all those hard edges on it. 
Mm-hmm. And suddenly, like two years later, every American car was aping that look, right? And 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 right now, it, in 2012, I'm noticing a lot of cars with like jacked up back ends. The back ends of the cars are very high, front ends are very low, windows very narrow. Like I'm looking at these cars, going like, man, if they go off a bridge, are they going to be able to get out of that thing? You know, um, it's a so rolling we, blind spot kind of thing. Well, it just it's just like, how do you climb out of the window? That's that I mean, that's something I worry about a lot. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> Living in a place surrounded by lakes, uh, but um, but anyway, th- that's like a great example of how you can like see like what was in fashion at that time, right? Two thousand two right. Ford, uh, Ford Taurus very rounded. Two thousand five Ford Taurus all of a sudden it's very hard edged. Exactly, so, round is round, round is to pointy, <clears throat> round and and uh, you know detailed to sparse. Right. Right, you look at like you got a time uh, time scale on the screen there, but yeah, you go back to like 1890 uh, interior design aesthetics, right? Where you had the uh, potpourri pillows and lace on everything, and mm. very ornate. Everything was like uh, all. Yeah, yeah. Like my parents had like a actual sitting parlor set from the late uh, 1800s. And uh, all the woodwork around the edges, all like you know, like it wasn't it wasn't the smooth Herman Miller chair. It had all these points on it that could injure you. It was so not child safe. These chairs, <laughs> it was all this ornate design on it. So, so yeah, yeah. It's it. Um, I, perhaps that's one of the messages of design too. Is the uh, <clears throat> at either extreme, you have either um, death by. Uh, piercing and and uh everything is all uh pokey and ornate and death by chokeability because everything looks so shiny and swallowable everything's a jelly bean (laughs) but but yeah and and then part of i mean in 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 that in that uh what am i trying to say spectrum of fashion there's also room for iconoclastic uh design behavior right it's like are you trying to buck a trend are you trying to be unique in choosing a design that is antithetical to what is considered the convention these days, right? So, again, talking about Johnny Ive, you know, when, when everybody was gossiping about a potential iPhone uh, mm. in in 2007, I think is when it came out, right? I remember yes. some of the prospective designs were basically the click wheel iPod, but, like, you would actually, like, with, like, the screen would be bigger or something, and it would have, like, a, you'd use the click wheel to navigate the keypad or something like that. Like nobody knew that it was they were just going to eliminate a whole bunch of controls and narrow it down to just one little button that would be like your main source of control with the thing, right? So. Yeah, it is interesting. We have this like this vocabulary of what's already occurred that yeah. a lot of times that defines what we assume and choose what's coming next, and it's just more of the same or some kind of ramped up progression. Um. We could go into a whole thing about whether or not science fiction predicts the future or informs the future, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> it, well, I, it, it, it is very interesting to, as an exercise where um, some design is very immersed in its time and others' designs really do stand out. And I think part of what helps define if it is doing that or not is, is how much of that like common wisdom common vocabulary and of of seeing things that have already accomplished similar tasks well is it is it abiding by those ideas or is it breaking free of them right. well where else do you want to go with this because um yeah we spent a little bit of time on this on these four quadrants of forces yeah, that affect design Do you want to talk about different examples, or what? What's next? Yeah, let's throw in some examples. I know you've got some ready for us. You've got some. Yeah. We got, we we got paper rock scissors. It. <laughs> Who goes first? Hmm. I I can. Well, I mean, jumping off the fashion thing, I guess tertiarily. Um, I can bring up some different. Oh, there's a whole bunch of things in here now. Yeah, I think you've got some uh, strong examples that connect with that. Okay, so yeah, when I thought about design uh in in i'm always going to think about comics Um, yes and i thought of a guy who made a lot of noise about how he liked his pages to look quote unquote (laughs) designy those were his words (laughs) 
and, and this isn't uh, Todd McFarlane. This isn't actually Todd McFarlane's work. This is, um, oh, let me look up the name of the fellow who was actually drawing this page. This was uh, Tony Daniel, I believe. This is from oh, wow, Spawn really? Blood Feud. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, the 90s, the 90s comics aesthetic, and a lot of people were racing to create works that looked... That, that shared this kind of aesthetic and ethos, right? Mm -hmm. uh, pages that were very, very dense in terms of ink line detail, uh, a little bit more abstract in terms of reading directionality. Uh, pages that, in, by my estimation, were as much about enjoying the art as a piece in and of itself as much as it was about enjoying the narrative. Yep, exactly. It's, Which, uh, it's yeah, yes, but, it's definitely... Uh, <laughs> An awesome example of fashion, right? Different, different values, different interests, different uh, vocabulary in in the aesthetic that was being um, uh, appreciated. Because maybe there's a life cycle to these aesthetics. Probably is. Um, now I'm recalling. Uh, I have to take a note to go look something up. But uh, this is definitely a celebration of that. Uh, there's so much power and energy in the detail and you can get lost in it and in fact you need to dive into it in order to um, glean what they're trying to communicate otherwise you'll just your, your brain will just bounce off the page and say wow tons of information and, and if you don't dive into it like, like you don't you do not get to you know participate in the story Right. So yeah, you'll be missing out on a, on a significant uh, aspect of the story if you just read the words and glaze over the art. Mm -hmm. Now, conversely, um, we can fast forward to uh, what is a celebrated style these days. Um, and and I want everybody to understand that I'm not making a value judgment on this. I like all this stuff. I picked all examples of what I would consider to be really well done designs. And this is Vera Brosgol's artwork from her graphic novel Anya's Ghost. Uh, very very different by contrast, and uh, and in this I would I would say I would make a a wild generalization and say that a lot of the stuff that's being published by trade book publishers like the the first seconds Scholastics tend to fall into this kind of part of the spectrum of very clear clean open sort of uh, illustration style. Also more it, it adherence more to the grid, which. Has a very that that is a design choice, and that's a right. storytelling choice that that communicates a very different thing than when we looked at Tony Daniels stuff earlier, right? Mm -hmm. Tony Daniels stuff, it was like, oh, awesome guy on the rooftop, wind is blowing, it's raining. <laughs> I, I I hear Nickelback playing in the background, you know. Uh, I don't hear Nickelback playing when I look at Vera Brasgill's art, right? Uh, no. Again, no, I'm not trying to like classify or or uh, qualify uh, anybody else's work i think these, they're both awesome in their own right yeah they, byom they, they, bring bring your own metal yeah there you go there you go so something beefy and metal goes with that and yeah B <laughs> byom um whereas with vera brosgles i i hear a completely different kind of music in my head when i'm when i'm looking at this right so, oh yeah and I'm i'm just seeing the uh well Let's see. When we communicate uh, people as symbols, when we have the the sort of the, the simpler outlines, well, Spawn. I mean, he was he's wearing this mask, and he's shrouded in a ton of intensity. You're getting back, just chains floating, and chains are heavy. Frick, have you ever pick up a chain? <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. and they're flying everywhere like whooshy hair. Yeah. <laughs> um and in this cape, capes are not light. Capes look like I mean obviously in stories, you know, whatever. You put on a cape, it's like, uh, oh, I can't move as well. Um yeah. I mean, they that's but it he's got so much mm, going on. He can this is all just whipping around him like right. Nothing. Uh like like just frothy hair. Um and but of course, like so then I get to his face eventually. Um, and this is awesome. Like, Tim, this is, well, these are, this is where I come from. I see, uh, I feel a strong kinship with this kind of fashion. So I've recently started to reconnect with how I do love the old uh, uh, early 90s Ghost Rider. So uh, oh, God, very much of that, great... uh, of that aesthetic, but even different. But at this, you know, where, where instead of being as 
polished of lines, as many lines as there are here, the lines were a little more chaotic, showing a different kind of intensity. You talk about Mark Texiera, yeah. Exactly, Mark Texiera. Yeah. Anyway, but yeah, way different kind of message here because I'm not even getting to his face until, you know, I work at it. Yep. Um, and in fact, any other, yeah, there's a, um, yeah, there's another. If I were, oh, you had not, want me to pull up another comic example that I had? No, 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 no. There's another character oh. there too, but even like faces oh. really weren't that important. So like that, that empathy with, uh, him as a person, right? It's more him as a, you know, incredible, powerful icon of something powerful and awesome yeah. that it's just exploding awesome. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, it's it's really the 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 way I would define these two, the difference between these two pages in terms of what 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 are they achieving through the design is this page, whether you like it or not, whether you, it appeals to your sense of of style and design or not, it's mm -hmm. inviting you to stop and look, look at this and behold the artistry, right? Uh, whereas Brazgal's stuff, right. and I'll pull that up again. Hers is saying, read the story. Don't, yeah, don't hang on this. Yeah. But also the symbols of the people are are they are simpler symbols that you're meant to identify with their their core emotion, yeah. right? So yeah. It, but very symbolic. Where so if you look at these two pieces as information, just as raw information, like what if we are? Uh, uh, sorry for the old sci-fi reference, but the Matrix, right? So if you're in the Matrix and you're watching the code or whatever. This is just code. This is just information flowing at you. Very different kinds and di different densities and, and uh, 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 a different flow to this, each of these images as a stream of information, right? Right, yeah. Um, I mean, you would see a lot, like, like in the flow of the spawn one, there'd be a lot of busyness. Like there's a ton of things coming at you where this, it's like uh, a calmer flow with it that has a lot more sparsity in it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, not you're not you're not uh, invited to sit and stare at this for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. Just keep moving. There's a different kind of visual flow, and again, we're talking about the different ways that it's laid out. The way that the panels are arranged is a completely different design aesthetic. So, uh, yes. did you have anything? That you, uh, your turn. Your turn, pal. <laughs> your your move, creep. Robocop. <laughs> where the, that's where the Taurus got. Um. Um. I guess I, I don't know. Pro, in a, through product placement, we were introduced to it. Um, I think in RoboCop. RoboCop, yeah. Anyway, that was a, that, yeah. That was in uh, one of the early parts where he was uh, at the gas station, right? Yeah, it was uh, the it was the cop cars. It was yeah. It was it oh, really yeah, that's right. Used. Yeah, Mur yeah, Murphy and Lewis uh, drove a Taurus, did they not? Ah, somebody's gonna correct me. Yeah, that's, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm I'm remembering from viewing it ages ago. Uh, let's see here. Parts of communication. I don't know. I mean, I've got some interesting examples that, uh, yeah, we'll see how this goes here. So, oh gosh, different ideas, different feelings, different goals, and designing is like your way to navigate through all that. And, you know, like the design is a solution to try to, to bring all these things together. Um, and... I think in order to uh, come up with that, it's a, um, I think of design as both a, uh, not that these are inherently separate, but creative thinking and a, um, let's see, a very intentional or um, critical thinking exercise. Mm. Is this is this time to mention uh, Andy Rutledge? Because I think that was one of the points he made in the article that you linked to recently on your blog, interactive-storyteller.com. Yeah, this this is yeah this is cool. This this would be a um a really really strong explanation of it. There, um, Andy Rutledge um has a great blog. Highly recommend exploring it in general. But uh, uh, one of the uh, highlight series I think that really ties into our our topic is um he has a series called the Gestalt Principles of Perception. And um, let's see, what is it? Four or five parts. It's um, five parts. Yeah, yeah, he talks about. Um, I got it up here. I can quote from it. He has uh, Gestalt principles one: figure ground relationships. Principles mm -hmm. two: similarity. 
uh, how the, the similarities between objects and shapes and things, uh, our minds uh, build relationships. We infer relationships from that. Uh, principles three is proximity, uniform connectedness, and good continuation. Mm -hmm. So when you think of one of the examples he uses is if you have a paragraph of information, the paragraph itself is a design because if I it took all the words, as he says, I'm quoting him now or paraphrasing him, if you took all the words out of the paragraph and just scattered them, that's the same information, but it's not designed. There's no good continuation. You can't tell what it's supposed to mean until you put it into the design of the paragraph. Mm -hmm. uh, common fate. Common fate, the uh, an, a key idea from that is you're driving on the freeway with a bunch of other cars and suddenly another car is driving at you in a different direction. That catches your attention more so than the cars next to you on the freeway because it doesn't share the common fate of the elements around you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then closure, and this is where he says a lot of smart stuff that basically Scott McCloud talked about in Understanding Comics. Oh, where yeah. I felt it was very echoing, like of similar concepts. Basically saying that closure is the essential element of comics. Comics couldn't exist without closure. And what closure is, is it's us. Okay, I, I draw a picture of a guy playing with a yo-yo. Well, here, let me pull up a whiteboard. I can do that right now. Yeah, cool. This will make sense. Um, so, open up pod, share, and new share. Let's make a whiteboard, shall we? So, okay, grab my pen. And here's a yo-yo, and here's a hand doing the yo-yo. Now, when we look at that, we can make we maybe infer some motion out of that, or it could be just the yo-yo dangling. But when I do this, yep. So now you did a second panel where all of a sudden, instead of a well, instead of a dangling yo-yo, it's now um, back in the person's hand with a sound effect and some uh, speed lines. Yep, and yeah, and a little burst effect indicating the the force of impact of the yo-yo returning to the hand. A little whap. So, if this is where we have to get a little abstract, uh, and this isn't actually that abstract. It's just it's for visual storytelling. This is the weird thing to think about. Is that, and, and I try to make this clear in my classes too, all the time. Uh, grab a bigger pen here. And different ink. This element and this element are literally just two separate drawings. And if you really want to break it down, they're just a bunch of lines that we're sort of connecting into a hand. Mm -hmm. uh, objectively, that's not a hand, right? This is not a pipe, that old. Exactly. Mosaic. The symbols are not the things which they represent. Represent. Exactly. Yeah. And so, too, are these two, these two panels not really a connected uh, movement. There's no movement here. And this is one of the reasons that I get so fired up about comics, get so excited about I do public talks where I talk a million miles per hour. If anybody's seen my Ignite talk, where I fit a 20-minute talk in five minutes. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is why I do that, because we connect these moments. We make that movement happen in our heads by virtue of that space in between, that thing called the gutter. And so his whole bit on closure is how just by putting things in a row, we our brains automatically look for the patterns and try to form a movement or narrative between those different elements. That's why comics work so well, and they're so easy to read, even if um, you know what goes into them is actually pretty complex. Yeah, exactly. Like, well, we will participate in filling in the information based on our expectations, our assumptions, and creating meaning and uh, harmony between those parts. And closure is used in filmmaking as well, even though it has emotion, right? Like So like the example that McLeod talks about that I think is a good one is killing somebody off panel, right? Oh, it's like yeah. he, he has the two panel sequence where the guy says, now you die, and then the guy says, no, no, and then the second panel is just a back away, like a, a view of the city, and you just hear the scream. And then McLeod says, you all decided where he put that ax. You all decided what was the killing blow, right? So you got, what's his name? Uh, Hitchcock does this all the time, right? In Psycho, the the girls in the shower, Norman Bates comes in. You never see the knife penetrate skin. You do not see a single gore thing. You don't see uh, any nudity. All you see is her screaming face. Knife goes up. You see a splurt of blood on the shower. You make the you put all those pieces together, right? Oh my gosh, I'm forgetting the name of a movie. I'm trying to subtly look it up, but I. Um, let's see. 
Uh, do 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 It's the one where um, the main character is Maximus. Gladiator. Oh, Thank you. Gladiator. Yeah. Okay. So um, I remember it reminds me of a conversation I had with my wife, and I explained that. Oh yeah, I mean I read some behind the scenes info about Gladiator, and uh, it's not that violent of a movie because all of the all of the um, the killing like they were able to have a uh, what I think a PG thirteen rating, because as much um, sword play and you know chopping of parts and whatever happens none of it happens like actually on screen or very little right yeah. it always is sort of a and they, they had a common approach where there was a pan away and then the act the, the so a person would commit to an act of you know so uh, it, you know chopping of a head or what have you in the middle of the gladiatorial you know arena yeah and you would see the you know, fighter A swing their arm and fighter B going, uh-oh, I'm open to this attack. And yeah. then fighter A is following through with it and then camera goes away, camera comes back, F uh, fighter B is slumping and, you know, no longer in the fight, etc. And I thought, oh, wow, that's really clever. I guess, you know, okay, that's how they did that. And now I could see that as I read the behind the scenes and I watched it again and I thought, hey, you know, we could watch this or what have you. It's not that yeah. violent. <laughs> but with closure working against me in that case, it was yeah. plenty violent because, um, yeah, I was. Um, uh, I was. Oh, it's very funny example. Yeah, obviously, you know, different taste as far as movies between myself and my wife, and I was able to excuse that, but then because because I wasn't appreciating closure. <laughs> There's yeah yeah closure is is super powerful. Uh, and a great example is is that uh, my brother, uh, who's a big man, he could kill me with his bare hands. Uh, saw uh, what's that movie called? The Blair Witch Project. Oh. Freaked him out. Freaked him out. He came to my house after seeing it in the theater, and he said, "I can't go to bed. I can't go to bed. You got to stay up with me. I'm all really freaked out by this movie." Wife Ann sees it. She thought it was hysterical. She thought it was a joke. She just did not understand what the big deal is about that movie. And she said, like, oh, I had to keep biting my lip. It was so bad that I thought it was funny. Now, okay, so you think, strong stomach, that woman, right? She could, she could really sit through a scary movie. We're watching Alfred Hitchcock Presents, the TV series from the 50s. 50s, <laughs> everybody, back when, you know, censorship was at an all-time high. You could not do very much on the screen. Uh episode where there's a murderer going around the neighborhood and killing all these women and all the women keep changing their locks and the women are still dying and it turns out and i'm going to spoil it for everybody the murderer is pretending to be a locksmith or he is a locksmith who is being when he gets called to change the locks he kills the women and he does all this misdirection so you don't really realize is it the locksmith or not and in mm -hmm. the very end the woman's on the phone with her husband saying there was another one i called the locksmith don't worry he's on his way and the husband knows he, mm -hmm. he just figured out and so he's like Honey, get out of the house, get out of the house. And then you hear the door close and you see a hand come in front of the woman's face. And that's all they show. But Anne was like grabbing my arm and clawing me, you know? <laughs> She's so freaked out by this story. And nothing violent, nothing really graphic happened on the screen, right? Uh, yeah. But the ideas that Hitchcock aligned his images just right so that it was, you filled in all those blanks, right? That's that's the power of closure. And as a matter of fact, uh, what's his name? Rutledge says in his blog, he makes uh, a pretty strong case for it. These are powerful tools I'm exposing you to. Please use them responsibly. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, he has a lot of uh, fun personality as he as he shares uh, his, his examples and, and uh, uh, the, the principles. And there's another thing that he that he does called the um uh, let's see creativity is not design test that yeah that's what i was reminded of when you were talking about the difference between creativity and uh thinking of design so yeah that's uh at andyrutledge.com we'll link to it in the show notes yeah and it, it's worth checking out and it's 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 a really it's a helpful sort of um it's a fun exercise and and you can sort of explore the examples and um um i think we'll go ahead We'll go ahead and ruin one um, sure. for you. Um, Pull up whiteboard. Yeah, let's see. Do do do. Design test example. Actually, I have this. Ah, so okay. <clears throat> in thinking about design, um, the top two 
sort of slides or what have you on this on this page are uh, are sort of like examples. Like the the first one is one that I that I made up, but the the second one is pretty much straight from uh, Andy Rutledge's uh, test. And uh, the question for let, let's go to uh, the second zone. Let me get out the drawing tool here. Um, so in this area, what of these two groupings of objects, which one looks more man-made and which one looks more natural? Well, I would say that that one looks more man-made, the second one. Okay. Because there, there's a, an apparent order to everything. Apparent. Apparent I mean, order. There may be yep. a more complex order on this first one, for all mm -hmm. I know. That I can't, in, I can't infer immediately, but upon looking at that, yeah. And uh, yeah, that it's what's that. That was my that's my first thought too. And what's interesting is there's no answers on Andy Rutledge's test, <laughs> uh, which I find uh, endearing, and that that's a cool approach. But um, yeah, I guess I like to you know to have the the rest of the dialogue as well. Um, so. To me, I could see both arguments being made very strongly. I, I agree with this one um, initially. But then I thought, nature is full of mathematics and fractals and patterns. So wait I a was going to bring up, yeah, uh, have you ever seen the film Donald and Math Magic Land? Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I would love to own that. That is a re that, I missed that thing. That was a fun one to, to see. It's on DVD time. again. You can get it on DVD. Um, but yeah, it, there's a... Out. The whole film is about how uh, the Greeks discovered the golden proportion, right? The golden rectangle. Oh, my uh, word. Which... I'm surprised that we don't have that example in this. <laughs> yeah, and, and, like, and, and they go into how the golden rectangle can replicate itself to infinity by virtue of its two-to-one ratio. It's used in all Greek architecture. It's also used in paintings, and it occurs in nature. Uh, they show how it, it, the, this golden rectangle is actually a natural phenomenon, and the spiral of the golden section upon the, the infinite replication of the golden uh, rectangle. Yeah, you're doing it right now on the screen. That's exactly it. You see that in shellfish. You see that in certain flowers. So, yeah, that's a good point that you bring up is that for, this could possibly be the more man-made one because in nature, there, nature is entirely... The, the, the thesis of Donald and Math Magic Land, for those who haven't heard of it, it's a Disney film in the, I want to say the 60s, maybe late 50s, um, which was basically a math propaganda film. It was like to get people excited about math. Uh, and one of the cases that it makes in there is that math is in everything. So if you think that you can avoid math, you know, and, and it's also got some really cool design in it. Like they explain uh, how geometry works in three-cushion billiards, and they use a lot of cool design principles to express how three-cushion billiards works and how geometry figures into it. Yeah, design, geometry, a little bit of trigonometry. Um, uh, really good stuff um, as uh, as game programmers too. To so you get exposed to that, where you get an appreciation for um, oh yeah, some really good uses for this math. Yeah. Um, and speaking of uh, video series related to this, um, that uh, that that Charles and Ray Eames. Yes, video the films series. of Charles and Ray Eames. Very yeah. interesting. Um, because you can tell, like, like, obviously they had produced a lot of videos for, um, for sponsors. Uh, for IBM. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, which, wow, what a neat collection. I mean, good on IBM to, to, um, to fund that kind of thing, right? I mean, yeah. what would drive that? I'm, obviously, it's, it's the drive to have a, a, probably a shared culture of, similar design biases and experiences. It's like they're probably their way of, of uh, encoding rules of thumb that they wanted to have their people share. Yeah. Um, wow. Um, <laughs> I we'll, bet that we'll still be... goes on at some places. But... Yeah. Like that, that I bet it of... also has a long delay before it would become public as well. Right. Yeah, because I don't remember ever seeing those Charles and Ray Eames films in school or anything when I was growing up, and that was like 20 years after they were made. So it seems like they would have made it into the public school curriculum film reels that we used to watch. At some point. At some point, yeah. Uh, yep, but um, very interesting, though. Um, yeah, so, but but right, uh, and back to the, um, there is a lot of uh, 
math in nature. And so I, I could see either argument, honestly. And I think it's that very act that makes us designers. Where you, you're, you're, you're observing the pattern, you want to become a, um, a curating part of establishing and propagating those kind of patterns, right? You're, you're an active actor in this design choice creation of work and art and communication that incorporates those intentional choices. There you go. Yes, to, to to take it back to the golden rectangle, when the Greeks discovered the golden proportion, uh, somebody could have said, so what? So it propagates itself in nature. What did he do? You you figured it out. Good for you, Poindexter. But then artists, artists came along and said, well, let's see what happens if we use that thing in our architecture, in our art. And they made some of the most famous and enduring designs of the our species, right? The, the Parthenon, uh, some of the, the Greek statues that are museums that are celebrated. It's not just because they're old. It's not just because, like, hey, look how old this thing is. It's also because of its beauty, right? So, no, and yeah, and sometimes you have to unbox the ideas that went into creating it to reappreciate them, especially yep. if, it's, if you're out of the context now. It'd be like looking at 90s comics when you're, when you're really appreciating, you know, what's really hot and current, where you'd be like, what did they see in this? Yeah. But all of a sudden... If you establish that little bit of vocabulary, you may unlock a whole interesting world of design choices that led them to that. That probably are in some way because of the subtleties of those design choices that they want to speak to your human being, your human mind, and your ability to see and observe this information. And if they're hitting you at with... Let's see. So something as the like as powerful as the the, the golden mean, the golden rectangle, um, you may be a, a feeling or observing that whether or not you realize it, probably are. Yeah. Because you've absorbed it so much in nature, and it's just this part of your. I'll I'll pull out an example uh, that I've used in the past, and this is borrowed from a friend of mine. So mm. it's not my thought, but it's not my example. But you read a book. You love the characters. Oh, they're making a movie about the book. You go see the movie, and you go, hmm, that's not who I would have had play that character. And then somebody asks you, well, who would you have play that character? I don't know, but not that guy. Uh, that just goes to show that when you read that book, it was having an effect on you. You had a mental picture of what that character looked like. Even if you don't know what that picture is, it's there. It's a that, that story is acting on you. Nature acts on us in that way. So when we go, ah, that's the first step to thinking about design is when you say, uh, and this is something I, advice I give to all of my uh, young cartooning students. They're like, where do you get your ideas? I'm like, what are you kidding me? Ideas are all over the place. All you have to do is every time you go, oh, uh, uh, those are moments where you're being invited to say why. And the moment you stop, the moment you have that experience, you go, why? And then, and then answer the question as best you can. You've grabbed a design, writing, illustration, storytelling concept and put it in your tool belt, right? So. Exactly. Um, like, how did they have that effect on me? Um, is yeah. a, is a wonderful, yep, uh, a wonderful thing to explore, and to build up your own heuristics. And uh, how do you connect to design principles? And how do you connect to whatever design fashions? Are you an iconoclast? Do you? What are you working with? And what are you avoiding? And you're becoming a conscious actor in those choices. So, in other words, um, this example you got in the lower left, uh, we all know that the iPad is the actual, you know, the right aspect ratio, weight, look, feel. Uh, that was ordained, right? I mean, we just know there's no other iteration of a tablet device ever. Is there any kind of golden rectangle? I wonder if that's what is, is designing, defining the proportions of that thing. Um, oh, I, I read an article, actually, I think it was on the unofficial Apple web blog, that the golden proportion was worked into the iCloud logo. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, you know what, I, I work, I refer back to that a lot. Even like, uh, sometimes I'll just pick that as a, as a creative limitation when I'm starting to draw or design something, and sometimes I'll wander a field of it or whatever, but... Um, I should look at my sites and see if I have it anywhere. Uh, I wonder if the Comics Are Great logo fits into the golden rectangle. Now i got to find out. And if it doesn't, it's going <laughs> to. Um, yeah, so what's interesting is, is uh, I think we have a lot of material for this series. We'll see what we end up covering. 
Yeah, because we're, we're already coming up on, we, we can't go over an hour and a half, and we've got about, yeah. like, I think 15 minutes until we're there, so. So, I, I do want to, um, I do want to wrap up this, this, this intro episode, and, um, and I think we, we've nailed a, a few different strong points there, um, with, Yes. And fair warning, fair warning, we're going to be a little recursive on this. I know we're going to come back to Charles and Ray Eames. We're going to come back to Rutledge. We're going to come back to Johnny Ive. We're going to come back to all these different things to build on these points and further elaborate on them. Yes, my exactly. Mind. We're coming We're coming back to comics and abstract things and very concrete things and silly stories and what have you. And, and hopefully, yeah, this will be a fun exploration. And please do contact us with your design observations and questions as we go along here too. Yeah, that would be helpful because uh, we want, you know, <laughs> we're talking about usability. We're talking about keeping the fact, keeping in mind that we're designing for humans. Mm. Um, one of the shortcomings of doing a podcast is the lack of interactivity. When I'm in a classroom, I can tell whether everybody's on board or not. Uh, having been the unfortunate recipient of an audience that literally fell asleep on me at one point, <laughs> you get that feedback immediately when you're doing public speaking or public work in like a classroom. But in a podcast, it's a little bit harder, a little bit more time shifted. We don't know. Uh, when we did the episode a couple episodes back where we talked about the emergent task planner, we did get feedback. And so we said, wow, that was a lot of talk about designing or, or rather writing down everything that you're doing and not actually doing stuff. Uh, I won't be using that. So I got feedback that that wasn't a useful episode. We for had somebody. strong uh, positive feedback as well too. Um, we did. We had uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, there's right. Some th sometimes when you um, tackle a topic, there there's such a strong example that ends up taking. It's like a strong flavor in a sauce, right? I mean, that emergent task planner is is garlic, man. <laughs> I was, yeah, I was gonna say it was wasabi <laughs> or wasabi. Yeah, well, yeah, that would that's a. <laughs> That's a and, and, and I love wasabi. I love I love my chats. I love my spicy uh, Eastern foods. The hotter, the better. Uh, but yeah, it's not for everybody. Um, but yeah, yeah. So um, you know, feedback would be super helpful. What are you wondering about? What is the part that's confusing you? Uh, doesn't have to be anything as fully formed as uh, as a question. It could be, well, what about what this guy said? What about it? Right. That, that, that's a way to get our wheels turning and let us start crunching on what you're interested in. Uh, but we know what we're interested in. We'll keep heading that direction as well. Yep. But uh, Weave it all together. Any homework for everybody? Should we tell people to go watch the films of Charles and Ray Eames? Most libraries have it. Oh, I gosh. I, yeah, I think it's, it's really worthwhile. Um, I mean, finding uh, Donald Duck in the Math Magic Land, uh, the, the, yep, the films of uh, Charles and Ray Eames, I thought it was interesting. Um, I mean, I think the the Wikipedia articles on uh, um, all those, you know, design figures, and also honestly, Her Herman Miller as a company, um, because uh, I I didn't realize that they actually pretty much invented the cubicle. Oh wow! Yeah, and uh, which is sort of a it, so divisive as a as an idea and as a thing in our society. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and now there's talk about the open workspaces, right? Where we're going back to like the, what they did in the late 1800s where everybody's just in an open area with open desks, right? Yep. Uh, th th those, th we're talking about fashion again. I just looked on Netflix uh, for those in the United States. Uh, Eames, the architect and the painter is on Netflix. 84 oh, minutes. interesting. 2011 documentary. The films of Charles and Ray Eames are DVD only, but mm. uh, you can at least do instant streaming of uh, the Eames. Ann Eames documentary. Uh, very, very interesting people. Uh, also, read the Rutledge article on the five uh, Gestalt principles of design. Man, that was fascinating reading. Exactly. Very interesting stuff. And it's just about, well, we're, we're building our vocabulary to become better designers and to be become better advocates of design, to convey this to uh, a variety of audiences. And I don't think that any, that being intentional or explicit about this kind of stuff in any way diminishes creativity. As a matter of fact, I think it frees up creativity. It it makes you it gives you more potential for expression because you have a wider range of tools at your disposal to express that cre uh, those creative ideas. And I think uh, sort of the the, the tension between um, uh, service design and create creative acts as um, 
in a service oriented manner where you're you're building them for something versus uh, in a as a pure act of expression and then how those relate and, and overlap and all that I think yeah we'll be we'll be tackling that for sure in uh... Uh, yeah that'll probably be in the next one uh, yep. if, if, if you're wondering what we mean by that if anybody's ever seen the episode of The Simpsons where the itchy and scratchy show gets a new character named Poochie and they do that wonderful scene where the animator is being harassed by the producers of the show, and they just mm. keep saying, no, give him more attitude, I attitude, you know. Uh, that's where having a, a background in, and having like a little bit more of a, an intentional uh, approach to design might be super helpful to you, because what the heck does that mean? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> because chances are you, your hand and your pen and your mind are... are part of the uh, the design machine for serving something chances if you're listening to this right and then as you serve that you know that customer that machine what have you that village um, well uh, you know they might ask you things that that's that that go against what you you know you you feel or know or may not be considering certain considerations that you think would be worthwhile and there you go. That and that's the, engaging in those conversations in some kind of manner that helps spread more use of design and being intentional communicators. You can absolutely embrace both the creativity and the intentionality, and the you know being scientific about it. Uh, yeah. It's not exclusive. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, being an artist, is, it, it does require a little bit of science. I know nobody likes to hear that. Nobody likes to hear that. But... I love hearing that. Love it. <laughs> you, you're, you are an anachronism, my friend, because uh, you come from that time probably like around like the 1700s when the framers were building this country when being a scientist <laughs> and an artist were the same thing. Uh, yeah. These these days in, in our more uh, categorized and compartmentalized society, everybody wants to say, "I'm just this to hell with it," and I don't have to think about it anymore. You know, so I, I notice when, whenever I start talking about perspective drawing in my on my comics classes, and I say, "Yeah, you have to know a little bit of geometry in order to do proper cartooning," they're like, "Oh, what? No, you know, so I'm an artist, not a mathematician." No, it's really fun, actually. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, it goes both ways too. And being like, I'm a coder, not a designer. And yeah, well, are you producing something visual <laughs> for someone else? Hmm. Here, yeah, here's here's a closing thought. Don't don't let those let's not let's not let categories define who we are, shall we? Let's go back to 1968 <laughs> and let's look Joe Friday in the eye and say, "Don't put me in a box, man." <laughs> exactly. <sighs> okay. So are we done? We yeah, it? I think we're done. That's that's awesome. We we got this thing kicked off. Looking forward to keeping cool. it going. All right. Feedback can be sent to leanintoart at gmail.com. Lean into art on Twitter. Uh, and then we're on the Google Plus. We had a Google Plus page. And uh, so and then leanintoart.com. You can look at that site that was very carefully designed with a lot of tension between me and Rob arguing over which way it should go. We could talk about that for a future episode as well. Certainly, some of, some of the uh, debates that we had about the nature of the design of the site. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, could be, could be, uh, yeah, regular podcast. Could be after dark again. That topic. <laughs> Let us know if you would enjoy that or not. Okay. Well, all right. Well, thank you, Rob, for this awesome, awesome kickoff of this. Uh, what's, what promises to be a super fun series. So, uh, ah, until, thank you, Jersey. In my pleasure. Until the next one, I've been Jersey Drost of. Comicsrate.com and Jersey on the Twitters. And I've been Rob Stenzinger, who I'm a huge fan of Comics Are Great. I just wanted to mention that, that if uh, you're listening to this and you're enjoying it, highly, highly recommend the awesome conversations Jersey has with uh, a bunch of creative comics interested and comics industry related folks um, about, about making and appreciating comics. It's an Too awesome kind. show. So Too kind. Check it out. And you can check out my stuff at Interactive Storyteller, interactive-storyteller.com. Oh, Rob Stenzinger. Okay, bye. Okay, oh, bye. Rob Stenzinger.